No! Ah! I forgot to do the thing. Sometimes uh -oh. I get ahead of myself, but we're here. Hold on. Hold on. We get to start now. All right, now we're really here. This is This Week in Science, the weekly podcast broadcast. Ah, oh, we're live. No Blair this week. She is on a holiday. And um, this is the live business. And if anything here needs to be cut out, it will be cut out for the podcast version. So remember, you can always subscribe to the nicely better, hopefully more better cleaned up podcast version uh, that's all over the place. But click all the likes and the other things so that we can hit the algorithms in the places where you're watching live. Hello, bumbling biochemist. I am a bumbling podcaster, broadcaster. You ready to start the show, Justin? Let's do it. All right, let's have a show. We are beginning in three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 924, we recorded Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023. May the 4th has quantum microscopes. Hey, everybody, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your heads with aminos, heavy metal, and textbooks. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Published in 1859, On the Origin of the Species, Charles Darwin's Theory of Evolution, is one of the most important scientific theories ever proposed. It changed the way we understand the natural world, our place in it, as every explanation that preceded it was wrong. Not just a little wrong either. Not fuzzy on the details or mistaking correlation for causation wrong, but critically, fundamentally, irreconcilably wrong in every way. Before Darwin, species were thought to be generated, like NPCs in the simulation, created by a divine being remaining unchanged throughout time. Understanding evolution is foundational to the understanding of biology, providing a framework for understanding the diversity of life on Earth, how organisms are related to each other, how they change over time and adapt to their environments. Evolution is key to understanding how ecosystems function, how they are affected by human activities, and how that affects humans. It underpins everything in genetics, as genetic variation arises through evolution, passed down from generation to generation, and is essential for studying the genetic basis of disease and traits, which informs disease risk, and the invention of cures. It's also critical for understanding human history, the deep evolutionary history of how humans evolved over time, how they are related to each other, and animals, plants, and bacteria too. Microbiology is at its core a study of evolution. Gained traits, lost traits, adaptive responses to changing environments. So it's extremely disheartening to hear that one of the most populated countries on Earth, India, evolution is being currently removed from textbooks for children. So hopefully this trend is reversed because otherwise a tremendous portion of Earthlings will grow up without being interested in This Week in Science, coming up next. Every kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening Good 
good science to you. And a good science to you too, Justin. And no Blair this week. She is on a holiday, but we're here to have a great time and talk about all the science with you out there. Thanks for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We have so much fun and serious topics to discuss this week. We're really looking forward to bringing them up. Are you ready to drop that science beat, Justin? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. On this week's show, I have brought stories about quantum microscopes. Can we has them? Yes. May the fourth what? make them so. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, photosynthesis. There's some new fun stuff related to photosynthesis and Bose-Einstein condensates. Uh, making amino acids out of the air and then uh, pollinating frogs, heavy metal, heavy metal seals, and reading your brain. What do you have? I have, well, I'm gonna, uh, I've got the, uh, a letter from about 1,800 scientists and science pro-sciencey folks in India about the textbooks removing Darwin. I've got a little uh, to read on that and talk about that there, too. Uh, I've got a yeah. question, like one of those question mark headlines. Are the aliens listening? Question mark. Uh, it's going to be kind of a fun story there. Black Are ice they? on the Greenland ice sheet what that's all about and getting beyond the blood brain barrier ooh i know this story i'm excited yeah. about that one yeah that's yeah. going to be a great one okay so for all of you out there if you are just tuning in for the first time this is where i tell you that if you want to subscribe but you can find us all the places podcasts are found we stream live here weekly on youtube facebook and twitch wednesdays 8 p.m pacific time until the show ends usually hopefully kind of a tight 90 minutes and yeah, there's a little eyebrow raise there from Justin. And we are on social media. If you would like to follow us as Twist Science on Instagram and on Universidon. And we are This Week in Science on Facebook and uh, Twist Science on Twitch. There's all sorts of things out there. If you want to find us, you can find our website most easily, twist.org. Let's get started. Let's get into the little teeny tiny wonderful things in the world. And how do we see the little teeny tiny wonderful things in the world, Justin? With a, with a microscope. Yes, microscopes. Now, we have microscopes that use all frequency, frequencies of light to be able to see smaller and smaller and smaller things. We've got electron scanning microscopes. We've got microscopes that use x-rays. We've got microscopes that are using all the different light wavelengths. However, light is limited in how it can be used to visualize things in cells because as soon as you start using particular frequencies like green or red to, uh, to boost the amount of resolution that you have by using a very, very fine frequency, a particular frequency, and boosting the power of that wavelength, what happens is it gets very damaging. And so we can only look at tissue that we don't mind destroying as we look at it. So to do things like look at cells as they're dividing, to look at anything that's alive without destroying it as you're envisioning it well you have to you, it's hard we are limited we can't see all the things but now there may be some work that is published in nature communications out of uh, caltech that will be allowing us to see at higher resolutions and in effect is using quantum entanglement to double the resolution of light-based photonic mi microscopes to the Heisenberg limit. Okay. Oh, I didn't know they, they, there was yes. such a thing, such a limit. Yes. Yes, there's a limit. <laughs> so light, we have Heisenberg's, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle that's related to um, where uh, and, and, and Heisenberg's limit 
dictates how far those photons are going to be, be going. And also it involves the entanglement aspect of uh, whether or not light is a, is a particle or a wave. Now in this particular work, the researchers were able to, instead of just using one photon, like one photon of light goes down a microscope and bounces off of whatever you're trying to look at and comes back to your eye, get, uh, magnified through glass and oh that's exciting we get to see it more clearly well in this particular case they entang entangled two photons so they have created quantum microscopy by coincidence ah coincidence. oh now we need a coincidence per, uh, principle limit <laughs> on top yeah. of the uncertainty Yes. So uh, you have an object that you want to look at. You have two entangled photons. You send them down separate paths. They interact with whatever material at a exact point in tandem. And because they're acting in tandem and they're entangled, it can actually double the power of the microscope. And that's how it's going to allow the power of the microscope to be doubled with out make increasing that intensity of the light beam. So it's like sending a single photon, the strength of the beam or the amplitude of the beam is acting like it's a single photon, but because it's entangled, you get the power of two for one. So it's like a Twix candy bar microscope. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but this microscope will be able to massively increase the resolution of our microscopy, uh, doubling it so that we will be able to now see the interiors of cancer cells without destroying them in the process of their division. Uh, we will be able to look at living, living cells, at living organisms, and... Be non-destructive in our science, and uh, this what they're what they're using. They think that there's no theoretical limit to the number of photons that could be involved. So potentially, the interesting aspect of this is potentially they could entangle more than two photons to go from not just doubling the power of the microscope to quadrupling it quintupling it to the power at 64. I'm, it, it becomes a bit mind boggling if researchers are able to use more entanglement with more photons. Uh, the, the resolution will just go up and up and up. Um, but they do know that every time you try to entangle a photon, the probability of the entanglement is reduced and so that it just becomes difficult in itself and so you need quantum computers and this whole thing quantum it's i don't know quantum mania everyone question yes i have so many question <laughs> did they build a thing or is this a theoretical thing so they have built it they yes they have built the thing they have built okay. it so but it's it's a lab microscope so we've got um Optical apparatuses, the you know laser beams that are uh, shining, mm. yeah, shining light. They're um, uh, bouncing them along paths using mirrors. Uh, this is like this is an engineering lab microscope. This is not a microscope that's in a box that you can you know, take home at this point in time. But it could be the kind of microscope that is uh, developed to become a product that would be used in. Uh, in high resolution mic microscopy in those places that have the capability to be able to uh, manage the quantum entanglement aspect. Yeah. I'm, trying to, I'm also yeah. just trying to think, what do you think the best, highest use of that is? I mean, do we, where, where do we want to catch the, a living cell that's not going to be uh, destroyed? Well, there are so many aspects of biology that we haven't really viewed yet. We've been using uh, the SLAC uh, linear accelerator 
uh, for, I think they changed the name of it, the Stanford Linear Accelerated, uh, they have their LINAC and they've got another X-ray production uh, device that they've been using to make little movies, high resolution movies of the insides of cells. But this is the kind of thing where instead of relying on single images taken over time, we might actually be able to view things taking occurring um, that mo molecules interacting with each other, uh, mRNA interacting so with if we get down to uh, that level and ribosome. Are at yeah. That would be yeah. that would be really useful. Yeah. Yeah. So if we're looking at the internals of cells and can get to molecular level stuff, that's the level yeah. that would be very exciting. Um, but even just being able to um, observe, you know, just just the insides at a much higher quality and resolution um, would would make things better and prettier for what we can see. And, you know, it's like take going from the Hubble to the James Webb when you step up in resolution. Yeah. Or or don't step up in resolution. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, uh, but, it just but, clear, uh, but, it. but drop in power. Because uh, you, yeah. then I'm thinking, uh, if you were trying to monitor something like stem cells that you were going to put into a, put into a patient, you'd want, yes. to, you'd want to not be doing any damage, but you would want to be looking to see if they are at that mature state uh, and ready to go. And so you would be able to verify mm -hmm. that potentially with a microscope that has the same resolution as now, but, uh, but less power, so there's less chance of doing damage exactly okay. yep yeah this could be huge it could be it could be huge it's uh you know it's a very it 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 when it is used is going to be the question because at this point it is still in an engineering lab and it is not a product that research labs can put into uh into play but it is uh it is something that could become very useful in the near future. And I see this moving forward very rapidly. So, yeah. Fun times in quantum land. What do you have for us? Oh, well, I guess I was going to start off by just sort of reading. Uh, this is a statement put out by the Breakthrough Science Society in India. It's part of their response to textbooks having evolution removed. So these are... Uh, ninth and uh, ninth and tenth, maybe eleventh grade textbooks that, for the science portion of you know your regular standard, everybody goes to school. This is this is twenty four thousand uh, school systems with millions and millions of students throughout India who are being impacted by this. So the government did has this this group called I think Insert. And during the pandemic, they scaled back the sort of learning modules, deciding that, you know, we're going to do have you do less schooling at home during the pandemic just to make mm -hmm. because it's already stressful enough, which kind of makes sense. <laughs> However, yeah. what they what they cut out during that was they left out things like Darwin. They also left out a lot of other interesting things we might talk about. No, oh, we're just going to leave out parts that are crucial to your understanding. No. Yeah, just going to leave out <laughs> some points. So anyway, pandemic begins. students are back in school and they decided that they were going to rationalize the education system. Their words, content rationalization. Oh. By leaving Darwin out. Now, they still get it, I guess, in the, the last year of what would be like high school or something. But that, that's it. So this is a letter from the scientific community objecting to that. And it sort of just this is the intro to it. The country's scientific community is seriously dismayed to see that the theory of biological evolution, which is an integral part of science syllabus in the 10th standard, I guess that's the 10th grade, has been dropped. It was first dropped as an interim measure for syllabus reduction during the corona pandemic, but NSERT states that it is dropped permanently as a step in content rationalization. Scientific community feels that students will remain seriously handicapped in their thought processes 
if deprived of exposure to this fundamental discovery of science. The fact that the biological world is constantly changing, that evolution is a law-governed process that does not require divine intervention, and that humans have evolved for some uh, species of a uh, from some species of ape have been the cornerstones of rational thinking ever since Darwin proposed his theory of natural selection. Expressing these concerns, the scientific community has issued an open letter signed by more than 1,800 scientists, science teachers, educators, science popularizers. Oh, well, maybe that would be us. <laughs> and rational-minded citizens condemning this directive by the insert. So, but like I said, it's not the only thing going missing. There's apparently a whole lot of history of India. Oh dear, that is being removed. Apparently, they've they've removed all mention of the what are they the Mughals, which was this uh, India uh, Islamic India, the rulers of India, the you know the main religion of India for a long time, like the Taj Mahal. Are we familiar? <laughs> Yes, the, but the history of it, or the Taj Mahal's been just, removed. Just completely. the Taj Mahal building. Just picture that. It's gone. <laughs> the you know the folks that built that uh, were were Islamic or Muslim. Uh, yes, and that's being removed from the history, which is interesting because the building is still there. But this is my fear: is like when that building goes down, you will you will, that is the point. I think when India will have gone completely uh, into this this regime that has a religious bias, mm -hmm. science is against this. So is history, you know. And science is a big part history of that. History for also sure. Art, yeah. So, so is all of a lot of science gets tied up into this desire to change history. Like a lot of science. So it's really unfortunate because again, big portion of the population of the planet is going to be uh, kept a little further away from science going forward. And that, that I think, is one of the very big points there, is that uh, if this educational system is countrywide, uh, not con continent-wide, <laughs> uh, countrywide, oh, yeah. country you know, <laughs> um, that <laughs> this is one of the largest countries and growing countries in the world. And if, um, you know, it... it it would be allowing um, the, a lack of information to be reaching one of the most rapidly growing segments of Earth's population. So, so there's that is, is is absolutely like, and then the other part is, what happens when you get rid of good information? Yes, you make room for bad information. Right. So, yeah. if people have questions, if kids have questions, but it's not in the content, then it you know have they given they've just taken stuff out but have they made room for how information is supposed to be added back in for kids who want more well uh, actually so the the there is there is some comments from uh folks that work at the this part of the government who are, are stating that you know well they can go on the web if they want to look stuff up like that they're taking out they're taking out real numbers <laughs> 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 no, uh, let's see. We've got um, in math the just looking through this. So the text contents of the textbooks have been rationally rationalized in view of the following overlapping with similar content in other areas in the same class, similar content in lower or higher classes, the difficulty level content, which is accessible to students without interventions from teachers and can be learned through self learning or peer learning and then content which is irrelevant in the present context. I think that's making massive assumptions. I mean, every oh, there, it's it, not it's, a, just, it's making how much it's, how much how many of these school kids, I mean that's the big argument here in, in the United States, how many of these school kids really do have access to all the information to following finding real educational information as opposed to biased information. Yeah, and it's very agenda driven too apparently. So this yeah. is also it, it's fitting Sounds with familiar. A, religious fundamentalist context. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. and to not throw stones uh, living mm -hmm. in glass houses, mm -hmm. uh, which is, even if you live in a brick house, don't 
Don't throw stones. <laughs> Don't throw stones. It's uh, not nice. It's just not nice. But yeah, Florida. I mean, you know, that's the thing. We, if Florida exists, if Florida is, is, you know, I don't know who's following whose lead, but there's a this is happening in the United States too. It has been, and this has been a battle for years and years with intelligent design, with textbooks. Uh, we've talked about it for decades, textbooks being written so that they don't include information related to climate change or uh, the, the link between carbon dioxide and increasing temperatures. Uh, we have textbooks that have been edited in states across the in conservative states across the country or in school districts across the country where they are trying to take out information related to history related to science and so this is not yet yeah, this is this is nothing new uh it's just same game different country right but the the stakes are huge and yeah i agree yeah. this is a, it, it's a big deal Hopefully they can do something, right? Yeah, and it's by the numbers too. Is also part of the thing. Like you know, it, it, I'm not sure that uh, I won't say. I was going to say I'm not sure we were going to get any great scientists out of Florida in the first place, but uh, that's not fair. I know. That's not uh, fair. But certainly, uh, you know, schools. India. You got a billion people. Like the the smart science kids are going to uh, be in greater numbers there. And, and uh, mm -hmm. to hear that they're going to be discouraged or, you know, it's like one of the things too, it's a, it's a, it's a funnel, right? Yes. The earlier you get that interest going in science, the more you're moving through the, that funnel towards becoming scientists. The longer you wait to try to spark that interest, the less uh, individuals you will have going along that path. So partly it's, it, yeah. you know talking about a billion uh, or more people. And and if you have these grades where the possibility of out of this population of a billion or more people, how many of them are going to make it to grades 10, 11, 12, where this more this information about Darwin and evolution is be is being included? Um, you know, it's not being included in the lower grades. So like you're saying, it's not just getting kids interested in it. It's getting them exposed to the information um, so that they have a basis for understanding the more complicated content later. But also yeah. if they leave the schooling system because of whatever forces end up leading to that, out that, that outcome, they have had instruction and they have some place to start. Yeah. Yeah. It may it makes me sad. I want as much information for children as possible, right? We should think kids can kids are smart. Kids learn things. Kids pick things up very quickly. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And you talk to you talk to the these these people who are, are scientists, as we occasionally do, as you are one of. Mm -hmm. And and you when you say when well when did you first get interested in science? It's not like oh well you know it was my second year of college and I took a science class for the first time. I thought hey that's pretty that's not no no. It typically starts much much earlier. Uh, you know, yeah. Most most physicists or uh, something like this are kind of know that they're, they're interested in this or, astro or cosmologists or know that they're interested in this by like age ten. They're already mm -hmm. like. You know, knowing the names of the planets or paleontologists may have already known all of the names of dinosaurs that a brain can hold at one time by the time. I liked I old. liked I liked making mud pies and playing with worms. Yeah, I didn't Who know. Who knew? My, Who my knew? interest in science came much later. Well, no, that's not quite true. That's that but that's no. even even that's not see, even that's not true. Not true. Was, the interest yeah. was there uh, from watching all those those Nova specials. And then from uh, a couple of good science classes at school. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we can't put all of the, oh, the content's available to those kids that are interested. It's out there. It is, but the schools are there. The educational system is there to give a basis for everyone. And if that, and if that is the basis for a democracy, then when you lead away from that, it's putting another little hatchet mark in the pillars of democracy. Let's talk about uh, photosynthesis and 
how cool and interesting photosynthesis is. You want to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So photosynthesis, we know light hits the leaves, the leaves of the plants and the trees. And photosynthesis is the process of turning that light energy into the air that we breathe, using up the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And did, yes, Justin's pointing at a plant. Yes, plants, they are good air cleaners, good oxygen producers. They're wonderful. And photosynthesis is the key to this. There are little chloroplasts within the leaves that uh, have specialized structures within them, photosystem one, photosystem two, which lead to the movement of energy through the cells and allow for that transfer of light for electrons and ATP creating and the whole process to get started that ends up releasing oxygen in the first place. So researchers are really, really interested in looking at how the energy moves through these chloroplasts and the photosystems. And there's one study that's out today or this last week related to figuring out the last step in uh, in photosystem uh, photosystem two, which is leads to how the electron moves around. So basically one photon, it's like a game of baseball. One photon gets in, there's a batter up to bat, the batter woo, hits the photon, whatever gets electron moves through the photosystem one spot. And so you've now moved from your ground state of zero energy to one. And then another photon comes and that uh, that electron moves to second base. And you've got another electron on first base. Another photon, you've got an electron on third base. And then another electron comes in, you've got a home run and you make, uh, you make oxygen. And so it was this last step between third base and home creating the oxygen. Everyone's like, ah, we got to figure out what's going on here. Well, they figured out some more steps. Super awesome. But there are other questions involved, which is like, really, it's not as direct as that. The electrons, there's like, there's no baseball diamond set up in the cells of these leaves that's but I just, transmitting but I the just electrons learned around. That. I know. But I just learned that. So you. now, so now <laughs> imagine that, that that baseball player who's running from home to first to second to third and, and back home again, that instead of hitting every base in between each base, it's like a completely random obstacle course where it's like, this way looks great. No, this way looks great. I'm going to go down this slide because that makes it faster. And I'm going to go over here and that way great. And See, so now, the if, base, if sports the was actually player, like that, I would totally watch. The baseball player is finding the easiest, fastest way to get to each base. Okay, so that's the electron. The electron's the baseball player. The electron is like, just, I'm going to get there as fast as I can in the easiest way possible. And each time, it's kind of different how it gets there. And so it's this randomized path through the chloroplasts and the photosystems until the oxygen gets actually released because you have enough energy built up. Okay, so some researchers at the University of Chicago looked at what they see as internal to this movement, these electrons, every time they move, they also create a hole next to them. And the electron and the hole partnership is called an exciton. And this exciton, as it moves around, is very similar to where they've also seen excitons turn up in Bose-Einstein condensates. These superconducting materials, we only see them work and allow this specialized, really easy electron flow in highly crystallized structures at sub-freezing temperatures. The plant has this in a very kind of randomized, not highly crystallized way, just kind of randomly popping up in there. It works really well. We've never put it in our models because that makes our models for photosynthesis too confusing. Researchers think maybe we should be putting it in our models for photosynthesis now. Um, but they're finding what they're saying are these islands that independently within these photosystems act like little baby superconductors, like little Bose-Einstein condensates at room temperature because plants are working outdoors, whatever, in the, you know, when they're in the sun, maybe it's a little warmer than 
room temperature, right? These plants mm -hmm. are doing their doing the work and they're creating out of non-crystallized structures, these little islands that act exactly the same and allow a more free electron flow. How does that happen? We don't know. But basically, there are little baby, baby, tiny Bose-Einstein condensates popping up in little islands in plant leaves and making it easier. Yes, hard jars, path of least resistance. Making it easy. This is uh, published in PRX Energy as of April 28th. And the researchers are very excited about, um, you know, what this could mean for creating future uh, photosynthetic materials of our own, for solar materials, for harnessing the power of the sun, for understanding, creating uh superconducting superconductors at room temperature. Uh, there are all sorts of potential uh, understandings that could come out of actually including these excitons into the models for photosynthesis and making the models of photosynthesis a little bit more complicated so that we can actually start modeling reality a little bit better. Yeah, it's always <laughs> nice. It's always nice to have the model <laughs> as close yeah. to your reality as possible. Close, close to reality. Yeah, I think that's the part that, um, you know, is is that's what we want. But we have to start out with the spherical cow, right? You start out with the yes. thing. It's like, oh, yes, the cow. It might have legs. But let's just make it a sphere. A sphere with maybe little stick legs. Makes it easier for the math, makes it easier for the modeling, but it isn't real. But then you have to start including information that makes your cow look more like a cow. And that's what, what has happened with climate change modeling, right? It's gotten more accurate. Mm -hmm. We've gotten better resolution. I don't think we're working with a spherical cow in our climate change modeling anymore. We're much better. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anyway, uh, it's very. I think it's very exciting. I like thinking of these little exciton islands in my plant leaves. Nice. Superconducting plant. Tell me something else, Justin. Do you want to tell me something else? Aliens? I'll tell you something else. Yeah, yeah. so islands in space. That's what uh, solar systems are. Planets <laughs> on them. Uh, uh... So this is kind of an interesting take because I have been thinking that we are going silent as a planet. So radio oh, yeah. waves, television broadcasts, Radio, these are waves that have that don't just bounce around on the Earth. They go out into space. And they keep going out into space. And for eh, 70 years or so, we were broadcasting a beacon in the universe of these semi-intelligent radio waves. These unnatural radio waves broadcasting out into space. So anywhere, you know, 50 to 70 light years away, if there's a planet out there with folks that can hear, that are paying attention, they might say, hey, this one area, this one planet over here, or at least this one solar system is making a very strange signal. And then they would know, hey, there's some people over there named the Ricardos. Or the Honeymooners, or whoever, whatever television show they saw first, right? Okay. But then we've gone all digital, and we're starting to stream, and now maybe now there's no signal, right? Maybe the signals are like, okay, there's still some radar signal here and there, but nothing like it used to be in the, the heyday of broadcast. Right? Well, we're getting we're getting soft and, and hollowed out, right? It's just less, yeah. right? Right? Well, according to scientists at the University of Manchester, uh, maybe not. This is Professor Mike Garrett, team leader of the project and director of the Giordo Bank Center for Astrophysics at the University of Manchester. And I'm going to uh, try not to do the fake British accent. Uh, yeah, try. Try. Yeah. Do your best. Although we have... Fewer powerful TV and radio transmitters. Today, the proliferation of mobile communication systems around the world is profound. 
While each system represents relatively low radio powers individually, the integrated spectrum of billions of these devices is substantial. Current estimates suggest we will have more than 100,000 satellites in low Earth orbit and beyond and uh, beyond before the end of the decade. The Earth is already anonymously bright in the radio part of the spectrum if the trend continues anomalously, not anonymously. The Earth is already uh, uh, anomalously bright in the radio part of the spectrum. If the trend continues, we could become readily detectable by any advanced civilization with the right technology. Hmm. This is this is different than what a lot of people have said. They like we're we're getting quiet. We're going it's away. The it, yeah, we're going quiet, and so no one's gonna hear us. And so it's just we send a message, nobody hears it. Somebody else sends a message, we don't hear it. But no. Yeah. So models uh, the, which demonstrate the signals that aliens might be receiving from the Earth were generated by SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, at, the, uh, in, uh, at their Hat Creek Radio Observatory. The modulation of the radio leakage generated by mobile communication towers on Earth as it rotates on its axis, as it might be measured by an observer located at Bernard's star, which is, uh, I think, one of the closest star to where we are. Simulations show that Earth's mobile radio signature also includes a substantial contribution, and, and that is come, uh, growing as the world's countries become more and more developmentally, uh, technologically advanced. Enabled, yeah. Mm -hmm. Next, the team is going to extend their search to, to uh, other contributors, such as Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi, right? yeah. Yeah, you know, because Wi-Fi is like, oh, gosh, it's not that. It's tiny little, you know, but if it's in every, if every house is broadcasting, it's one thing when every house was receiving signals. Mm -hmm. Why did the towers have to be so powerful? So they could send that signal to all those receivers. Now, every household has one or more of these things generating frequencies. So... Hmm. But yeah. that we have to wonder about. I mean, there's so much attenuation. I wonder I wonder how that would end up growing over time well, if, if you're additively putting it together with your neighborhood or, a, yeah. you know, the whole planet. That yeah. that to me is fascinating. That, yeah. Hmm. If we all how much are we adding? Yeah. If we all whisper <laughs> Jump up once. and down yeah. <laughs> at the same but time. But just on one side of the planet. We need to scrunch yeah. the earth out. A little, right. We'll do it. We'll do a wave. <laughs> Everybody jump on the count of one. It's a little <laughs> less, it's a little less exciting than the TV and radio broadcast signals going out because at least with those, you had, a, I had this imagining that they would be watching, uh, you know, television, following television and then commercials and everything else and the news of the planet as these waves uh, got to them, right? Probably, it might be a little difficult to pick up an actual channel that, that far away. But but this, would, this to me would seem much more like just noise. Yeah, yep. Uh, but it's not yeah, going to be listening to people's conversations or watching an individual TikTok, but there will be a signal. Or maybe they will. I, I I don't know. Like well, we also are assuming technology, right? Like the receiver technology. Like what are they? Maybe they're like super advanced. The other thing is, you know, maybe not. Like life, I have no doubt life li li exists everywhere throughout the universe. It's just probably fundamental property of nature at this at this point, based on everything we know in this one little planet. But intelligent life. So yeah, let's look for let's look for space Wi-Fi signals. Let's uh, like Kevin Unique is saying that you know these uh, signals aren't coherent. Frequencies are constant, having multi multiplicative power outputs. I see synchronicity all the time. It doesn't take much to put together a spike. 
there's noise in specific frequencies. So if it's just, if we can figure out like this study is doing the specific frequencies that we should be checking out for intelligence, what can we boost? And also what should, what else should we be looking for that we're not looking for, even though and we're actually, doing a bunch of scanning, but. And that's a great point too, because if we know the frequency that we're the loudest at, mm -hmm. we would want to use that to send out a signal if we were hoping to communicate, because mm -hmm. That's the place that people would be tuning into. You tune in, you know, yeah. if you have nothing but silence on the radio and you tune in, there's this one like, and you're like, oh, I listen to this weird sound coming from space. And then we can modulate a signal over that. Yeah. Then we can have a, a, a one way communication system to the universe. Ooh, one way. Uh, Barnard Star is a small red dwarf in the constellation Ophiuchus. At 5.96 light years from Earth, it is the fourth nearest known star to the sun after the three in the Alpha Centauri system. So I, I thought Alpha Centauri's stars were uh, were closer, uh, but this, and it's the closest star in the northern celestial hemisphere. Ah. So it all depends on which part of the planet is pointing in a particular direction. So... Barnard star. And it has the largest proper motion of any known star. 10.39 seconds of arc annually. So it's got a lot of motion. I don't know what that means, but it's a good target. Let's yeah. aim at it. Let's send our let's send our kick our kisses and hugs and kisses from Earth to Barnard Star. Meanwhile, here on Earth, in order to survive the coming climate change apocalypse, we uh, will be figuring out what to do with our carbon dioxide. Oh my gosh. We're using more and more land to feed the cattle, to grow the sugar, to make protein. Yes. A lot of manufactured protein is actually a product of sugar fermentation. Sugar takes lots of ground to grow. And that again is not sugar that we're necessarily eating. It's going into our livestock feed supplies. Anyway, protein needs building blocks. So the uh, fermented sugar usually is used to create these amino acids, the building blocks of the proteins, um, and to then create a hydrolyzed protein of sorts. You put it all together, make a protein powder and or a crumble and make food pellets and feed it to the animals and the animals are healthy. Healthy, So are the bodybuilders and the sports junkies who like to protein pound. Anyway, we also, in addition to, we need to figure out how to use up our carbon dioxide because we have too much in the atmosphere. It's making it too hot. We need to stop doing so much agriculture for the livestock and if we're going to keep eating the livestock, we have to figure something out there. So researchers have just published their study, cell-free enzymatic L-alanine synthesis from green methanol in the journal Chem Catalysis. What does that mean? Cell-free enzymatic L-alanine synth synthesis from green methanol. Well, what they've done is they've taken carbon dioxide captured from uh, manufacturing sources. So carbon dioxide capture, using it as a source for the production of energy, chemicals, and fuels. In this particular case, the fuel is methanol. They are converting carbon dioxide to methanol using solar energy in this particular case. So it's not using any additional energy off the fossil grid in what they have designed. They have a multi-enzymatic cascade using 10 enzymes to then produce the necessary amino acid, L-alanine. L-alanine is the first of many that they hope to be making to replace these fermented sugars that we're using to create proteins that we use to feed the livestock that we use ugh, all this stuff that just use creates more carbon dioxide uses more land in their situation they'd be reducing carbon dioxide producing l-alanine it using less less ground space and less uh, agricultural space 
then would be taken by plants. And uh, also, if they're using solar energy or other sustainable energy sources to be able to power all of this, it could be uh, energetically less demanding on the environment in in its end form. <sighs> yeah. So that produced amino acids. We're figuring out how to do it. It doesn't sound sexy, but someday it's going to be what's going to be keeping you alive on the space station or on that rocket ship to Mars or when you get to Mars because you can't grow any plants. Or in your uh, in your cubicle. <laughs> or in your cubicle. In the mega, <laughs> mega skyscraper in that one part of the planet where humans uh, still yes. are allowed to yes. go outside. Yes, possibly. Or, yes. I don't know. I mean, you could... You whatever could whatever sci- future may come. Whatever sci-fi future may come. But I like to think of it as uh, an optimistic step uh, or a promising step forward uh, in the multiple pronged solution that it provides. Yes, JG. First thing, picture a solar cow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love our chat room. <laughs> I don't want a solar cow. No, no solar. Well, I guess I guess this is a solar cow in effect. <laughs> it really might be. It's a greenhouse gas cow. Well, no, a solar cow. That's good. Do we have any more stories for this first part? No, this is a part where we go to the break and we come back as uh, uh, with Kiki's Animal Corner. <laughs> it's not Blair's Animal Corner, that's for sure. Who? Not this week. What? What? Who? <laughs> Thanks for being here, everyone. This is This Week in Science, and we want to say thank you for joining us for another episode full of science fun and discussion learning hope you're learning a lot this week if you are enjoying learning don't keep it to yourself share this week in science today with someone you know will appreciate it and additionally if you are really enjoying the show you know you can head over to twist.org and become a supporter of twist by clicking on the patreon link and choosing your level of support everyone ten dollars per month and up will get thanked by name at the end of the show fifteen dollars a month and up you'll get a sticker every once in a while it's like every three months you'll get a new sticker what it's gonna be but you're going to get it okay now we will come back with dun, 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 dun. i'm not gonna play the song because it's just not right to play the song when she's not here but it is not blair's animal corner i feel like it should be a game show but it's not going to be all right justin to really get this started we want to talk about frogs. Frogs are so cute and nice and they're dying. <sighs> but, you know, we think of them very often as these amphibians who are just involved in insect control or uh, maybe they are the canary in the coal mines for pollution and climate change, warning us about what's happening. Uh, but in this new study we find that they may also be important for pollinating flowers. Yeah, so a species of Brazilian frog known as Xenohyla truncata. It's a tree frog, and it is a, a frog that likes to hang out in the milk fruit tree in Brazil. These little frogs eat the fruit of the tree, they drink the nectar, and dun, 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 they climb into the flowers of this milk fruit while they're there sipping the nectar. Oh, right, just like a small insect might do, or a bird possibly. And these frogs, yes, they crawl in, and the researchers discovered as the frogs crawled in and the frogs crawled out, they were covered in little pollen grains and the frogs were going, bouncing, jumping around between flower to flower, transferring pollen grains because they had been stuck to the moist skin of their backs. 
This is the first time this has been seen in an amphibian species. It's not, or in a, in a frog species specifically. So they don't know uh, if this is, yes, the effective way that the, one of the effective ways that this milk fruit tree becomes pollinated, or if this is something that is an evolved adaptation, if this is by accident. I mean, it seems very much like it could be by accident, but the fact that these frogs do love this particular fruit so um, is one particular point of how this relationship may be taking place. But again, it does really put the, you know, the arrow in the center of the of the uh, target or the um, the nail on the head of how important frogs and amphibians are to so much of ecosystems and the little roles that they play and you lose frogs to climate change or pollution and we may be also be having them disappear from uh, other important aspects of the ecology no frog. If we took the frogs away, what would happen to the milk fruit trees? We don't know that for sure. Yeah, it sounds like uh, very much to me like this, uh, like because you just possibly like, wow, how did yeah. the relationship start? That they may yeah. have replaced uh, like, a different pollinator, right? So right. maybe there was a, a thing that lured the frogs there in the first place, uh, a tasty insect or something, right? And now. And now it's, uh, you know, and the, now yeah. they're the pollinator because they like to, it's like, oh, the flower, this is a good flower. Yeah, maybe they were going in there for the insects to start out with. And then they're like, no, you know, I really like the energy that I get from this lovely nectar, this yeah, milk fruit. That's enough. Tree nectar, that's, that's all I need. Uh, moving from frogs, these cute little frogs in Brazil to fur seals. Let's talk about heavy metal. These are some heavy metal seals. They they really are heavy metal seals. These fur seals, they're called the Juan Fernandez fur seals because they have been found on remote islands off of the coast of Chile, about 600 kilometers off an archipelago that is also known as the Juan Fernandez Archipelago. And so these are the, arc, the Juan Fernandez fur seals. These fur seals, they hang out there and they hunt off the coast of the archipelago, off of the coast of, the, of, the, of Chile. And these researchers who were studying these fur seals, of course, were analyzing their poo because what's the easiest way to find out about what a fur seals going out and hunting and eating, then to, to you grab their poop because they're pooing on the rocks on shore, and you can it's easy to to find, and you can be like, oh, and now we know what they've been eating. And so yeah. they published their study in the Royal Society Open Science, and determined that these fur seals were uh, eating something that was massively contaminated with heavy metals. Oh no. Yes, mercury, cadmium, and this is a super isolated environment. So the researchers are like, how is all this heavy metal getting into their diet? Where is it coming from? Can I guess? From? Can I guess? Yeah, go for it. What do you guess? My guess would be a coastal uh, fish that is in a heavily industrialized area that is also heads out to the Archipelago, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Archipelago, yeah. Uh, and that they're eating those fish and that's how it is moving up the food chain. You are very, 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 very close. Ah. Very close, but not specifically. So instead of just fish, these seals love to eat um, squid and octopuses that they find, um, and also fish, but that they find in the area off the archipelago, which happens to be a, uh, a, a gyre. It is an area <sighs> where the, there is not a lot of mixing and there's a bunch of, it, it's the South Pacific subtropical gyre. So, so this there's is, a so lot this of ocean plastic. Yeah, there's tons of ocean plastic. 
They think that this plastic patch is bigger than India. Uh, this is part from uh, their their article they wrote for the conversation. Um, in addition to the plastic, you have phytoplankton that are existing in the gyre. Uh, these don't have really high concentrations, but there's other zooplankton along with the algae, the phytoplankton. Um, so the, phyto, the phytoplankton has have evolved in this area where zinc in the gyre, because for whatever reason, zinc is low. Phytoplankton likes zinc. Here, there's not a lot of zinc, so apparently the phytoplankton have evolved to use cadmium. So we've got cadmium-filled phytoplankton. The phytoplankton get eaten by zooplankton. The zooplankton get eaten by fish. And so we have this uh, cascade, like you were talking about, of bigger and bigger and bigger stuff, where the cadmium is getting... Uh, is is building up and building up and building up in all these organisms as it goes up the food chain, ending up eventually in the octopuses that the fur seals love to eat. However, the octopuses, uh, mollusks anyway, they know, uh, they don't know about the octopuses, but they know that mollusks are able to take heavy metals and isolate them. And they have an organ that is called a hepatopancreas. It's like a liver pancreas. It's all mushed together. Their hepatopancreas is able to isolate the heavy metals. And so the animals live without the toxic effects of the heavy metals. And then the, so the octopus does fine, is doing great. The fur seal eats the octopus and they think that the fur seal is just eating everything, right? Eating the hepatopancreas where it's all built up and that what they but the I they think that the fur seal should be getting sick. The levels of mercury and cadmium that are in the fur seal's poo suggest they are massively they're ingesting ingesting massive, massive quantities of these heavy metals. But they don't know like what's happening because the fur seals are not sick. They seem to be do fine and, do and healthy. They're getting rid of a lot of toxic heavy metals. So what's happening? Have the fur seals evolved a special mechanism of dealing with heavy metal poisoning? We don't know. And that is the that's the key take home of the story is yeah. these are these are heavy metal seals. They just, it, it's passing through them somehow, or they're dealing with it. It's not making them sick like it would make us sick. Interesting. So, so the, this gyre region. Yes. It was also intriguing. Uh, because gyre. Is, if it's, if that means that there's less uh, ocean floor motion. Mm -hmm. It's like, we talked about this in the, in the story, uh, not too long ago about the region near Bornholm, which is a, a, a massive uh, sort of kind of inland sea. It's not an inland sea. It's, an, it's connected to the ocean, mm -hmm. but still it's, it's really far away from it. And it's, and it's an area where there isn't very much current on the seafloor. Right. There's not a whole lot of motion. And, and so a lot of heavy metals there have built up just from drifting down to the bottom over the years. Right. There's like high concentrations of lead and other things, right? You know, so that's another another thing that could be adding to this uh, this this sort of heavy metal toxic environment is just dropping from the atmosphere. Where yeah, where things are ending up. We don't know enough about how I guess metals like that are mixing from the atmosphere. That's a really great point. I don't know how that would work. Not that it wouldn't. Yeah. But but it, yeah. but it it means that it sits if there's not if there's not a deep uh, you know, ocean floor current uh, to displace anything. It just it's all rests on that top you know a uh, couple of inches, uh, mm -hmm. which is going to be very different than the seafloor below it. So. There'll be evidence. You should be able to see all the evidence of uh, of lead fuels dropping in. I don't know how many yeah. ships go through that area, but uh, I have no idea. Yeah, no, no clue. Yeah, I, I mean, 
yeah, there's so multiple qu- multiple questions this. here, right? Where does yeah, it? Where do the heavy to metals the seals come from? To see how how they're resisting this this yeah. heavy metal and, uh, diet. Because that's not something we can do. So if we we don't we we don't eat the whole octopus, we only eat the tentacles. So we don't have to worry about the heavy metals. Well, don't, in... don't throw a we into there. I would get that. <laughs> I don't need octopus tentacles either. I'm not a fan. Uh, <laughs> but people are not getting the heavy metal poisoning from octopuses because we're not eating the organ that is isolating the heavy metals within the octopus's physiology. But when we eat heavy metals, when we have things in our in our environment and our diets that are heavy metal laden, our body can only get rid of so much and we we get heavy metal poisoning. The toxic toxicity effects are really damaging. And so if we could figure out how the fur seals are naturally managing their their heavy metal levels could be very beneficial to us. Harjo says that's fast revolution. Wait, but it might yeah, you know, it might be mm-hmm. a, you know a thing that's already there, right? Yeah. And so and so then then you encounter this this new thing in the environment, and it doesn't affect you because you already have something that's uh, you know able to counter. It. The Harjars has got a good point though. Are they looking at whales? Whales, but then you know there's there's a lot of other things in that environment, including the fish themselves, right? Yeah. Uh, do we so this is definitely a, going to be an interesting area to to study for sure yep mm, always interesting things to study so many questions out there in the world how does it work what's going on justin what's the next question that we have to answer oh gosh <laughs> i'm supposed to have a story ready aren't i yeah uh, get to it <laughs> okay what does it say oh yeah this is an interesting one so it turns out the glaciers of Greenland are teeming with life. This is headed by Professor, Professor uh, Alexandre Anesio with a group of researchers from the Department of Environmental Science at Aarhus University. That's here in Denmark. They have discovered that microbes have adapted to life on ice. Not just one or two species, not just a few extremophiles living on the on the glaciers but several thousand different species this is quoting alexander anesio a small puddle of meltwater on a glacier can easily have four thousand different species living in it they live on bacteria algae viruses and microscopic fungi it's a whole ecosystem that we never knew existed until recently so we know that life finds a way, don't we? Uh, it's been, we Indeed. have found life several kilometers underground without uh, living without sun or oxygen. There are billions of microorganisms that eat minerals down in the bedrock. We found the clean room in NASA. There was a bacteria that was specifically eating uh, paint in the in the clean room. There, uh, what else? We've got. Uh, oh, we got the tardigrades. They got to go to space. Come back. We took. They took a colony of more than three thousand tardigrades outside yeah. a satellite and, and sent them in an orbit around the Earth for ten days. And they're exposed, great. Exposed to the, you know, vacuum of space. And, you know, all the the radiation that would be lethal to and sixty eight percent survived. So life life does find a way, but until recently researchers believed that the ice had too little nourishment to sustain life. Plus it's really cold. But of course, the scientists were wrong. And gleefully so, because now they have something cool to say. So there is nourishment. It's just incredibly small quantities, explains Anesio. One of the microorganisms on the ice that the researchers spent the most time investigating is a small black algae. The algae grows on top of the ice and actually tints it a little bit black. What's interesting there is when the ice darkens, 
it absorbs more heat. When it absorbs more heat, there's more ice melt. So the researchers think that the, this growing, what they're saying is growing patches of this black ice from the algae yeah. is accelerating ice melt. Now, right. it's not because of but it, global warming, right? But what yeah. they're saying is that because global warming has, is extending seasons, it's extending the amount of time that the black algae has to spread. And so it's gaining more territory or ter it's gaining territory more rapidly uh, than it has in the past and is in a more sustained way. And they think it could be increasing the surface melt by 20%. Mm. That's, that's a lot. That's cool. It's that's, very significant. <laughs> yeah. That's extremely significant. Um, yeah. I, and as it grows, that impact will be greater and greater. Yeah. Yeah. And, and part of why, I guess, that they, they think that the, the, the reason they have this black pigment is actually designed on the algae's part to protect it from the radiation of the sun. But that heat kind of like melon, ice... like a melanin, or yeah, I don't yeah. Know, a little uh, fungi or algae melanin, a little UV protection <clears throat> so that it can survive the solar radiation. And and it's you know and it, they can only use the water that's present when it's melted. Mm -hmm. So you start to see this synergistic effect. Yeah, you know, a, a very great example of evolution, too, where, where mm -hmm. a species is becoming successful because its adaption, adaptation to one thing, solar radiation, is increasing its, its biome, its environment, the environment in which it can inhabit. And so it grows. Yeah. This is reminding me a lot of uh, the the permafrost melting as well. So we have the permafrost, which is supposed to be frozen, but it starts melting. And there is a natural breathing that it that takes place to this ecosystem over the seasons as it melts slightly. My, the bacteria within the permafrost get warmed up. They release methane. There's other stuff in the permafrost that gets released. But then the more the melting happens, the more the methane is released, the more the methane is released, the more the melting happens, the heating, the melting. And it's a feed forward cycle. And there are a lot of those. How do we put the brakes on? That's what we need. Yeah, apparently, NASA is very interested in this, uh, this fungi as well. Uh, because the for one thing is, you know, there's not a lot of water in space, but there is ice. So hmm. one of the things that would be uh, be more likely than than uh, than searching for microbes in in arid dust on the moon, for instance, would be looking for the ice patches on the moon yeah. where the water is present. And if something can live there where water is present, where there's, no there's and there's no atmosphere to speak of and there's just radiation right. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, something like this, this this algae would be the type of candidate you would look for uh you would want to be able to find a signal of or a sign of uh on another planet yeah for sure i want to find the signal it would be that's extremophile if i ever heard one what else do you have? Oh, yeah, you want more, do you? Oh, yes, give it more science. Oh, well, what did I say I was going to... Oh, this story. Yes, yes, yes. So, now, I don't really, I don't really completely understand the, this story, but uh, there's a... Okay, so can you explain? Maybe you, I'll actually start by asking you a question, Kiki. Yes. Can you explain to me... The blood brain barrier because I, I have it wrong. I have it wrong in my head. And I understand it, technically what it is is there's boundary between the brain and the blood. 
That's why they call it the blood-brain barrier. Uh -huh. um, but but where it exists, because I pictured it sort of like a hairnet, like just covering the brain, but it's covering the the blood brain barrier is actually covering the, vas the veins, the va the vasculature. Yeah, the so vasculature it's, of the brain. Yeah, so it's like a it, it's it's like a skin. It's an ep epidermis of sorts. <laughs> uh, it's it's tight tight cellular bonds that line the blood vessels so that it makes it very very hard for anything to squeeze through little yeah. tiny things can can diffuse through down their gradients water can go through osmotically across the across the barrier but it's when you get to be big molecules they they get to be too big to pass through but really that these are it's not a barrier it's not a sheath it it is these are cells Cells right, right, right. That, so it's, they're they're wrapped in a, they're wrapped, a couple yeah. different kinds of cells, including yeah. some types of neurons. But the but they're not. It's not a it's not a covering over the whole brain. It's the individual no. vascular veins that are going uh, to the brain that are wrapped, yeah. as opposed the to they wouldn't be wrapped. wrapped. But yes. the veins in the rest of the body aren't wrapped the same way, right? Not as tightly, no. But okay. we do have the same kind of control in our gut. So when we talk about people, yeah, so there are levels of like cellular adhesion and tightness at, at different places in the gut and that, you know, different areas throughout the body, depending on how much movement you want between an area and the blood or the other or the blood and other cells, you know, it, 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 these barriers, as we call them, um, are very important to impede or allow movement of molecules. And so yeah. normally carbon, oxygen, and water are allowed to go through the blood brain barrier, but it's designed to keep out uh, pathogens, bacteria, larger molecules that shouldn't be there. One of the problems, which is a great thing because we don't want these things uh, just making it to the brain all the time. That'd be terrible. But one of the problems with this is that then drugs that we want to go to the brain can't get there. And so when, when a cancer or some pathology, uh, meningitis or something, toxoplasmosis uh, occurs in the brain, we don't have access to get a treatment. Uh, to the location. Right. This research that was, uh, I've just completely lost because I have too many tabs open, is using, <laughs> here we go, is using a, a new technique of skull implanted ultra, an ultrasound device that permeates it's sort of basically that that sheath that you're talking about around the vasculature it kind of uh, makes it loose you hit it with this the sound wave these ultrasound waves and it just kind of relaxes it permeates it it becomes more porous and so by targeting the vasculature they can, and then injecting a, uh, you would just take a drug in, in some instances, right? And that drug is now circulating through the bloodstream, but it goes through those veins that go by the brain, but normally can't get through because, oh, it's, you know, it's like a big red ro velvet rope there. It says you can, nobody can pass unless you're at least this small or whatever it is. It makes it permeable to the drug. And they've uh, this the report I've got here in front of me is showing that they were able to get a chemotherapy drug to the brain utilizing this system. This, is, uh, this paper is published in Lancet That's amazing. Oncology. Yeah, and so the other thing that this can do, so it's so this now just opens up. This opens up. There are, there's a, there's a long list, there's a huge long list of theoretical treatments that could be applied to uh, ailments of the brain. But they've just been shelved, they've been sitting on the shelf because there's not a way to get through that blood-brain barrier, at least not safely. So in, 
an animal experiment in a lab setting, you can do a gene therapy treatment by placing that gene therapy into the brain. Now, the way you do that is rather traumatic. <laughs> right. Okay? Not something you would translate necessarily to a human patient. By being able to target a specific area where you are doing this permeation, you could also not just deliver drugs or chemotherapy drugs or... You could also do gene therapy treatments mm -hmm. with this. So this is this is opening up this ultrasound device. O opening up the brain. Literally yeah. is opening <laughs> up the brain access to all of the things that science has waiting and already developed, already experimentally tested a lot of different things. Because again, in the in the animal model, you can puncture your way in to test a gene therapy, a drug, whatever it is. Yeah. And so we yeah. have shown effectiveness on trials up till human. Then we, we've had to stop because there's no way to safely attempt these therapies. This, this could be that thing that allows all of these all this research that's collecting dust, all these treatments, all these potential cures. We're talking uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. meningitis, uh, metastasized cancers, all sorts, right? We're yeah. talking about a huge list of incredibly uh, pernicious diseases that are that that is an alter and so i guess part of it is just because ultrasound is i mean this this utilization is obviously so, very very advanced yeah. but yeah. but not new like it wasn't a revolutionary new technology that was required it was it's the use it's the specific. application came along now so yeah. i don't know i think this one's very exciting so yeah the so this is the the question is okay we're at this point still it's going to be for people who have something that's fatal, right? That you have a, a, a brain cancer that's going yeah. to kill you because you don't want to be sticking something in your brain, you know, a drug in your head like that you unless you know that's exactly what it's going to do is it's going to have a specific effect, which is get rid of that cancer and right. help you survive. So you don't want to go putting random holes in your vasculature. Here you know, Here's the thing. what if there's something else in your bloodstream at the same time, yeah, bacteria, yeah, yeah, yeah. other oh, things yeah. at the same time yeah. when you ultrasound yeah. that blood brain barrier just to put a drug in. So if you're yeah. doing, you know, this is still not going to be something to be taken lightly. It's going to be for the serious thing for serious uses. Yes. So, yeah. but now, but now this is, this is in a, this is, that's in the beginning. Okay. Yeah. So first, first of all, yeah. First of all, this, this will become more specialized for sure. Permeability yeah. also uh, uh, heals, I mm -hmm. guess, uh, recloses yeah. within twenty four hours. And that's, so that's the, also important. That's a key You're not point. leaving yeah. the door open. No. You are for. I mean, twenty four hours. It's a little. You got a blood while. circulating. That's a lot of time for it if mm -hmm. it's already there. But <laughs> you're not leaving. That is a permanent situation. The other thing is. I would think that you could get to, because you can be targeted with this, I mean, you can focus this beam, you can decide, here's the location in the brain that we want to access with a gene therapy. You can apply this to that direct area. You could even input that uh, the, the gene therapy or the drug or whatever it is into that specific region instead of mm -hmm. just having it circulate the blood you could actually become much more targeted with this uh, going forward yeah i mean th at this point it's still a skull a, a skull imp implantable grid of ultrasound emitters so you're still putting a hole in your head 
the ultrasound is not like a little thing, a, a cap. It like a you, it's it's it, not that it's not something that you're you know going to your hairdressers and you sit inside and it's like oh the little the little beam that you have no idea is taking place is doing anything is 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 ultrasounding into your head. There is yeah. there is impact. This is still or like this is early days. I think at the big point is the potential for where this is going to go. It's exciting, but. Um, yeah, so, opening up the but, blood brain barrier, huge. This is yeah. it's massive. This is this is not something that has been done before in this way. Well, also to be clear, there is a there's a infographic involved in uh, in this. I don't think it's the scale. <laughs> the the aperture that they're showing. No, 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 uh, no, no. It look the thing that's being implanted to allow this, I think, is much larger than the actual device. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I, I think this one's going to be one of those. Gosh, there's we we've talked about this a tremendous amount of times. You know, mm -hmm. oh, new treatment Can that could through? could if it could, yeah. but if we can't get there, so then it can't. We can't yeah. even try. Can you get in there? Can you get into the cells? Parkinson's, How do you get there? Alzheimer's, toxoplasmosis, yep. meningitis, metastasis, yeah. all these uh, horrible brain ailments yeah. and more uh, that now scientists can at least start experimenting on people. Yeah, but starting no, not, with... Not starting there, not starting there. Starting with Leo. phase three Leo. trial <laughs> after having done... <laughs> They're doing the, the research. They're not... Yeah, this yeah. is still clinical trials. Yeah. Yeah. They're still doing the work and they need volunteers for the clinical trials that's true yes yes volunteers. it's very important that they be volunteers Volunteers. yes yeah. <laughs> uh let's see this last week big news out about uh brain reading and decoding people's brains a study published in nature neuroscience on May 1st, semantic reconstruction of continuous language from non-invasive brain recordings. People have been very excited about this story. Headlines are across the board, sensational, sensationalizing it. Um, the researchers, part of it, I think, is because everybody's uh, big into artificial intelligence right now. The work for this group out of UT Austin has included machine learning and a an algorithm, art of, a, 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 an algorithm to learn brain activity based on fMRIs that are monitoring the brain of volunteers while they are listening, or while they listened in this case, to a bunch of podcasts and heard people talking and were listening to the words that were being said, and then. So the decoder, this machine learning system, had to learn what a particular person's brain looked like when it was thinking particular words, when that person was thinking particular words. And so they listened to a bunch of podcasts and then had to say a bunch of words and had to think a bunch of words. And they later had uh, the participants had the F fMRI reading them as they were imagining telling a story or listening to a new story. And the research uh, has reported that the machine learning algorithm, I'm not going to say artificial intelligence because I know Patrick is going to get on my Patrick Pecoraro. You'll, you'll, you'll talk to me a bit about that one. This, this machine learning algorithm was able to kind of, not all the time, but about half the time produced text that closely matched the intended meanings of the original words that the participant was thinking. So, wow. Yeah, so it's like 50% of the time it could kind of do it, but it didn't really always do it. And it was only for the people it was specifically trained on. So this mind reading AI that has been, uh, you know, brain decoding AI that headlines have been spouting about. If you've just been reading the headlines, you have not been getting the full story because this is not doing it yet. This is not general brain reading or brain decoding. Oh, I disagree. 
these are very specific instances of people who have been who have been trained and the AI has learned from them. The yeah. machine learning algorithm was trained on them. Um, but there were in experiments, for example, as it says in the press release, a participant listening to a speaker said, I don't have my driver's license yet, had their thoughts translated as she has not even started to learn to drive yet. So there's some contextual, the contextual there accuracy is, is so there. I, I disagree that it's not here yet. Look. But that's that's only it, about 50% of the time, but only that, on but, people that have been trained on. But that's that's the whole thing. Look, this is It'll get better. infancy. Yes. This is the infancy of this technology. Yes. So if we were if we were 50 years in and it did that, we'd be like, man, well, maybe it's not a thing that can really be done reliably. Yeah. You know, uh, if you ask the kids today, when was the telephone invented? They're not going to include the thing that was connected with a wire into the wall. I don't know what that thing was. That's not the phone. Phone has got apps and it can no. watch movies on it. That thing was a, that's a listening device that you old folks used to <laughs> the use. The squawk box. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when we're, when we're comparing, you know, when was, when was, when was, when can you uh, rec have recorded music? Well, yeah, it was, it was there, uh, you know, in the 1800s on a wax tourney thing. But I mean, this could be the same, not... what is it? A Alexander Graham Bell or whatever, or exactly. you know, picking, picking up the phone and, or I don't know who, who did well, the yeah, phone? But... <laughs> no, it, it, yeah, but the, the problem was like he, he kept, you know, he kept trying to use this thing, and then the guy on the other hand, on the other side, is like, yeah, hi, yeah, no, I know, I, I don't want to talk right now. Yes, I know. Watson, yeah, it's very exciting me? that you invented the phone and you gave the first prototype to me, but you can't keep calling me all the time because <laughs> no, I know you have nobody else you can call, but this is like I have a life. I need to do other, you need to make more of these and send them to other people so that, okay, all right, I'm going to let you go. All right. Well, I know who that is. I don't even need caller yeah. ID. It's only one other person with a phone. Anyway. Yeah, we've moved way past that. But at this point in time, we do only have, I don't know one lab with this brain decoding device because it does uh, rely on time need on an fMRI machine. So it's only wherever fMRI machines are found and people who have the algorithm to implement this process and the time to train individual people on the brain reading. And um, they're hoping that they can transfer the process to more portable brain imaging systems. There are others that don't have the same kind of resolution as fMRI, but perhaps if the algorithm learns specifically enough, they won't need the same amount of resolution as the fMRI. Uh, but this is the this is where we are. We are at this is an fMRI based thing for yeah. specific uses and in individuals at this point in time. But yeah, maybe someday it's going to be, you know, the patch in your head where you click a button and your computer knows exactly what you're thinking. It's going to be, more, it's gonna be scarier than that. It's going to be scarier oh, than that. But my prediction is they're going to do use like microfacial eye tracking thing so that it won't need the fMRI. It won't need the brain waves anymore. It'll use that to train the system to find ways to read yeah, yeah I, know. I know. I'm going to walk around and make it really weird faces all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know what the you know what it's going to translate into? I got to keep making these faces. I got to keep making these faces. You're going to have to concentrate to do that. Uh, uh, my last story for the night uh, has to do with anorexia nervosa and some researchers out of the University of Copenhagen. Copenhagen? Uh, so Right near you, right? Right close to you. Kuppenhaun. Kuppenhaun. Is that how it's pronounced? Sort of. <laughs> it, <laughs> On what day? So, the, so I just, just so the, the re, not just even the American ear, the rest of the world can't pronounce Danish properly. Okay. I, this is my. <laughs> but so, so it's Nobody fine. can. Yeah. It's fine. Great. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, this research, which recently was published in Nature Microbiology, I find absolutely fascinating. And apparently you wrote a, an article about it that I wasn't aware of. Uh, but I think it's a just a fascinating study. Anorexia nervosa is known as uh, it's a, di a disease where people die of starvation because people become less and less likely to eat. They starve themselves. Um, Karen Carpenter was one of the large, uh, I guess, older celebrities uh, to have succumbed to the disease. And the question is, for the longest time has been, is it just psychologically based? Does somebody become anorexic for because of social pressures and other psychological uh, re reasons? And does that then persist? Is it just a psychological issue? And this research suggests that that is not the case at all, and that there may be a very large component of anorexia nervosa, nervosa that is linked to the microbiome. And they haven't been able to determine cause at this point in time. It could be the social pressures lead to the, the lack of eating. The lack of eating changes the microbiome. The, the, that change in the microbiome then goes on to change other factors within the, the gut and the brain that then lead to a persistence of the lack of searching for food uh, in a person. But they don't know that for for at this point in time. What they have determined it by manipulating microbiomes of mice and looking at the microbiomes of healthy women and women with anorexia, uh, they were able to determine that there are differences in the bacteria that are present. There are some bacteria that are that have skyrocketed, some of them that have been lost altogether. Bacterial genes and metabolites that are expressed in the blood have also changed. And there are uh, also increases within the anorex anorexic group in a particular compound called indole-3-propionic acid, which in the gut slows down digestion, slows down the passage of food, and then it makes you feel full. So you're less hungry and you don't want to eat. So if your digestion slows down. So anything you eat is just going to take forever to go through. And you're just not going to be hungry, even if you haven't eaten in a very, very long time. Uh, they took the bacteria from the anorexic women and implanted them into mice. And the mice uh, uh, actually did, ended up having weight loss that was similar to the anorexic situation. Uh, they additionally had a group of, of mice. They, they put mice on restrictive diets. And the restricted diets also led to this, but those with the an anorexic microbiomes had a much faster weight loss and more permanent waste weight loss. And then there were genes in the hypothalamus related to appetite suppression that were released. So the, the genes in the brain were changed as well within these mice. So they were able to determine that there's actually physiological uh, signaling changes that are occurring as well. So again, we don't know exactly what's happening to cause anorexia in the first place, but there are some aspects of this that are perpetuating. And, and we were talking a bit about the climate feed forward stuff, the, the brown, the black ice and other aspects of that. This is, this looks to be a very similar situation. Yeah, so this is, you know, my take on this kind of is that it, it, it sounds like a natural self-defense mechanism. Yeah. The, the body is unaware of, in, on one level, the psychological drivers, mm -hmm. I would say. And so it says, okay, I'm in a food-restricted scenario. I need to slow down digestion because I'm going to need a continual uh, use of, of these nutrients over a longer period of time until I find food again. Also, it was having an appetite reduction effect on the brain. Yeah. And so... Yeah. So that's kind of like, I, I don't have food, you know, our ancient ancestors. You can't spend have... your whole time in yeah. the pangs of hunger because you need that energy 
to go and eat or go yeah. find food. And so it's helping fight off starvation. It's hard, yeah. it's helping uh, buffer or protect the the body from starvation. And in the case of of anorexia, it ends up facilitating the disease. Yeah. I think that this this kind of research is going to really help our understanding of anorexia and will move whatever treatments have been used in the past uh, away from solely psychological research uh, or psych psychological treatments, um, which I think, you know, if I don't know what treatments are currently being used, but treatments, any treatments that could be used to change the gut microbiome to increase um, appetite to lead, you know, to lead to the jump start of wanting to eat again uh, is potentially helpful. It's not going to solve those initial problems. So certainly mental health uh, approaches are important as well. But, you know, to see that there need that, that this is bigger than just a mental health issue, that there's a, a holistic aspect to this, that's really important to take into account. Yeah, and we're finding more and more evidence of this. We were talking about uh, a, a forms of depression that have been linked to the microbiota. We've we've talked uh, here about you know the the resistance to feeling hungry and also having lower energy output because again mm -hmm. it's the body's trying to conserve energy uh, in this anorexia microbiome. Uh, we're finding these these gut brain connections. Uh, to be extremely significant and so and so there there should be you know any treatment of of behavior that is being facilitated by molecular signaling from the gut mm -hmm. needs to also be addressed in the gut yep. otherwise you're gosh you're you're really you know you're really challenging people to to do something about it when it's not their fault. You know, there's a there's a yeah. also a recent yeah. study about uh, UTIs, uh, urinary tract infections mm -hmm. that f that found that multiple infections uh, tend to be facilitated by genomic changes in the urinary tract, and and this is disease, this is a uh, treatment that that it so it, it makes it so you're much more likely to have recurrent. UTIs if you've gotten some in the first place. And, you know, you can imagine for generations, it's been called an hygiene issue. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's not. It's not. A hygiene issue. It's a genomic alteration in the lining of cells that's facilitating additional uh, infections. So, so you know, I think I think the mental health industry is going to have to come to terms with uh, this to some degree too. That the things you've been doing aren't going to be enough, or they're just wrong. Also a possibility that there are <laughs> physiological molecular bases for some of the diseases that have not been addressed in all. So it's not just mental hygiene. Is my point. You can't right. just keep putting it on the individual. Well, your mental hygiene needs to be better. And so they go, oh, I will think positively. I'll do like uh, Think positive. This, it's going to change everything. All these effort, yeah. yeah, I'll think positively. And, but now I have another <laughs> I'm UTI. I'm searching for happiness. So it didn't work. Yeah. So I must not have yeah. thought positively enough. Yeah. It, you know, the, the, the trauma of bad treatment, right? Yeah. The, uh, the stress and anxiety caused by, by following uh, and adhering to a treatment that doesn't work over and over again must be exceedingly frustrating. So... Things like, uh, mm -hmm. things like this are very important. Yeah, things forget like the cranberry juice. Uh, you can still do that if you like it. But cranberry that, juice is delicious. It can be wonderful. But, but these but, poor people yeah. who are pounding cranberry juice and, you know, like the instructions for UTIs are just like, you know, here's how you wipe yourself. Here's how you clean yourself. Like... There okay. are, I mean, there are going to be. If you're a 50 year old woman who's getting uh, there, recurring UTIs, it's not your hygiene. It's there's other things involved. Right. There's hygiene is a place to start, but it's not the end of the story. It is the it is if you know it's like okay, you know how to wipe, fantastic. Let's move on, and we're going to talk about these other aspects that are very important as well, and other things that we need to be aware of. 
Yes. And I, I think, yeah, it's not all one thing or another and it's not going to be all pharmaceutical it's not going to be all positive thinking happy happy but if we can look at the system right it's the gut brain system and i just pointed at my brain as i said gut and i pointed at my gut as i said brain because i think that kind of as well it's it's so it's true (laughs) that's the point yeah exactly right yeah, and so it is one in it, it is a system, and that's how our bodies work. And so when whenever we take anything as independent and try to work just on that one thing, I mean that's what scientists get in trouble for, right? Not being interdisciplinary enough. You're just in your bubble and your glass mm-hmm. tower. Anyway, yeah, but yeah, yes, please, mental health professionals, please pay attention to this. And doctors, please t- please pay attention to this kind of research because this is the research that's going to help save lives and make yeah. lives better. This is the kind of stuff that uh, is going to matter. And it's amazing to me that that we haven't known more about this previously. Yeah. Why is this taking so long? Yeah. But I think that's it for me for stories. Do you have any anything else? No, I think uh, I think we're yeah, I'm good. I think we did a really good job, just the two of us, on this tight ninety yeah. tonight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, totally. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of this week in science. We are so glad that you were here, talking with us in the chat room, hanging out with us over there, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch. I see all of you in our Discord as well. Everyone who is here for the live, thank you for being here. It's great to have your interaction. Also, thank you to Fada. Thank you for show notes and social media work. Thank you to Identity4 for for recording the show. Justin, thanks for getting up early and doing the show with me. And (laughs) Rachel, thank you for editing the show. It's really wonderful to have you doing that work. And to our Patreon sponsors, as always, thank you for all of your support, specifically... Two. And, and uh, oh, just by the way, uh, Kiki. Yes. Because uh, the other week we didn't have. Uh, when did you, you make here? Did you make it up? But he did. No. So you have to read all the names twice today to, <laughs> to make up. Is that what you said I was going to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I promised the audience. You'd say each name two times as you went down the list. So do I say Craig Greg Pot Pots or yes. Craig Pots Craig Pots? You guys say the whole or, name twice. Okay. Yeah, Craig, Craig Pots Craig Pots. Yeah. How about I say the name and then you say the name? Oh, no, it'll take too long because I, I was like, wait, what did you say? How do you pronounce it again? It's easier if you do it. Craig Potts, Craig Potts, Marie Gertz, Marie Gertz, Teresa Smith, Teresa Smith, Richard Badge, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Kent Northcote, Rich Loveman, Rick Loveman, George Chorus, George Chorus, Pierre Verlazab, Pierre Verlazab, John Watnis, Ratnaswamy, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Carl Kornfeld, Chris Wozniak, Chris Wozniak, Vegar, Chefstad, Vegar, Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Hal Snyder, Donathan Styles, aka Don Stylo. Jonathan Styles, aka Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Ali Coffin, Reagan, Reagan, Don Mund- Don Mundus, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Steel, but no, blah, 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 blah. Stephen Alberon. You're doing great. Keep going. <laughs> Daryl Myshack, Daryl Myshack, Stu Pollock, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Andrew Swanson, Fred S 104, Fred S 104, Sky Luke, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, 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 Jack, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, John McKee, Greg Riley, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenblow, Mark Hessenblow, Steve Leesman, AK Zima, Steve Leesman, AK Zima, Ken Hayes, Ken Hayes, Howard Dan, Howard Dan, Christopher Rabin, Christopher Rabin, Richard, Richard, Brendan Minish, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Johnny Gridley, Climmy Dave, Climmy Dave, Flying Out, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Artyom, Greg Riggs, Greg Riggs, John Atwood, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Rodney Lewis, Paul Paul, Rick Ramis, Rick Ramis, Kurt Larson, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Craig Landon, Stu Doster, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, Eric Knapp, EO, EO, Adam Mishkan, Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Kevin Parachan, and Luthen, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, Paul D. Disney, David Simmerly, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, Tony Steele. And breathe. <laughs> and if you would like to support us on Patreon, 
please head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link on next week's show. We will be back broadcasting live uh, Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time. And again at 5 a.m. on Thursday, Central European time. Just uh, on our Facebook channels and yeah. also from twist.org slash live. Yeah, and if you want to listen to us as a podcast, just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. Don't go like to your shower and shout for This Week in Science unless there is a machine like Alexa or Siri or something who will give you podcasts while in your oh, shower. Yeah, then maybe possible. that'll work for you. Yes. If you enjoyed uh, the show, get your friends to subscribe too. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to the stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org. You can also sign up for a newsletter. Question yeah, mark. we have that's a yeah, newsletter mailing list. There we go. You can contact us directly. Email me, Kirsten. Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com. Justin at twistminion at gmail.com. Blair to ask her why she didn't show up tonight. Ha ha ha. She's on holiday. Don't email her about that. At Blairbaz at twist.org. Shoot, I had to sneeze. Whatever. Uh put twists somewhere in the subject line. That's right. So your email doesn't get bubbled by a sound maker and then burst through a barrier like and no, don't do that. You can also <laughs> hit us up on the Twitter for now, where we are still at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We'll love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We will be back here again next week, and we hope that you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science is the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop. Got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in. I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you make a It's the after show. Where did Justin go? I don't know. Oh no. He's probably gone to get coffee or maybe to get his son. He's probably gone somewhere. He's having a lot of fun. And I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just standing here. And I'm here with you. Because science is cool. Mm. I should have just turned the mic on Echo for that, right, Harjars? Maha. But instead, instead... I'm going to have a sore cheeks from saying all the names. Hi, Jars. I love that you chat a lot. I think that's wonderful. I like that people interact and are part of the show and have things to say. 
and are thinking because that means you're thinking about what we're doing. And that in itself is very cool. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. What's happening, you guys? Yeah. So where was it? You're it was back. back what? The bumbling biochemist uh, At the beginning? on in the chat yeah. said, just wondering, how do you find and choose your stories? So we may have Magic. different uh, techniques. I'm kind of curious. Uh, yeah, mine is osmosis. <laughs> I fall asleep with the internet below my pillow. <laughs> and uh, when I wake up the next day, all the stories have found their way into my laptop. Into your brain. Yeah, yeah, it's very similar. I mean, I have bed bugs who read to me at night, except they're reading to me while I sleep from all the science journals. <laughs> yeah. You gotta give them the right reading voices. material. <laughs> Something to chew on. Even. I yeah, so I do, I do my, my searching... Uh, Comes a certain way. So I, I have a, a side writing gig for the Science X Network. And so they send me assignments. So those are not yeah. selected. I get a couple of assignments. They could be on anything. For some reason, they send me a lot of medical research. Uh, so I write those up. So I'm writing a couple of stories a day that were just assigned that I had no selection portion of. For for and so I've been pulling from that quite a bit because oh they send me some interesting stories and once you you hear about a story you want to share it so I've shared a bunch of those on the show recently but usually I will scan through the headlines of something like fizz.org or Eureka Alert mm -hmm. and uh, yeah yeah it's after a while of scanning through <laughs> these I was like. Hey, somebody's writing this. <laughs> let me go. Let me yeah. go ask. Why? What did? Why? How? Who gets to do that? And you can. I was like, oh, apparently, yeah, any dimwit. <laughs> uh, Not but any dimwit. You came with credentials. I came with a, this show was my credentials uh, and a little bit of a little bit of lab work, but a little work. Yeah. Uh, so, so sort of scanning through there, and then you'll get uh, sometimes a very uh, concise story uh, outlined in a press release, and sometimes it's not as concise, but it's still interesting. So then you go to the the study itself and you pull out the the more interesting information. You know, uh, examples of this are sometimes there's there's studies that that sound interesting, but there's not enough. There's not enough in the press release saying that they did a thing. You gotta figure, you, the interesting thing is like, how did they do it? How did they do it? Yeah. Like that might be the whole part of the story that's like the real interesting thing. Yeah. Not just the, uh, not just the result or not just the discovery. Sometimes it's the method. And sometimes it's negatively correlated. Like, I don't know how many other things Science uh, writer people are doing this, but I, I think about 10% of the stories that I, I cover also on this show are kind of picking apart a study. Like there's yeah. sometimes when, when I, I read a study, and I go, wait, there's, you, got you know, there's a, there's a problem either in, in the methodology or or in, in, you know, what's not being looked at or in your sample size or, you know, that sort of thing. But I start yeah. usually Eureka Alert because it's a, a nice aggregate and, and fizz.org, mm -hmm. uh, also a nice ag ag aggregate, Medical Express, uh, mm -hmm. another, where, where a combination of people writing about science or press releases from the universities or researchers themselves uh, are available to sort of scan through. Camera shy. So highly selective uh, on this program. Uh, and then the I'm... writing side is, is completely just assigned. Here's, here's the research paper. Good luck. Yeah, I have, again, yeah, similarly, I've specific websites that I like to go to that I kind of trust, but it's, it's a matter of skimming through and finding what I think is going to be interesting to talk about. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not, but oh, Justin left me. He could have just said goodbye. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hey. I was, like, oh, you, I was like, oh, you left. You could have just said goodbye and it was time here's to a, go. Here's a fun fact. Uh, <laughs> if you're if you're on the the tab where you're streaming, don't click a link. The other uh, I was gonna say the other big one I go to is, is of course uh triple AS. Yeah. Uh, uh, which yeah. is also I mean that's what Eureka Alert is. Yeah. But the ones that they profile in the in the science the journals or nature journals when they when they put them up on their front page usually those are uh, a little bit more impactful stories. But on the other hand, those are also usually stories that are already getting more press coverage. Like this, this is sort of an unwritten aspect of the show. Uh, we but we've talked about it sometimes. Mm -hmm. If there's a study, if, if, you know, by the time Wednesday night or Thursday morning comes around and a story is already being covered uh, in the mainstream press to, to uh, correctly, we will sometimes just skip it. Yeah. Because, you know, and, and honestly, th this job is, is daunting on one level because there are now, you know, thousands of stories because of what I would call the junk uh, papers. The junkification uh, of uh, junkification of publishing. scientific literature is, yeah. is a real thing. There's mega journals that are taking, you know, so, so also the journal that it's in can mm -hmm. matter. Yeah. I think, you know, the, I, I, I definitely take into account, the journal, but also the institution that it's coming from. Um, also, whether or not I'm familiar with the researcher, I don't have to be familiar with the researcher, but, you know, it, that's like one of the things that I can yeah. take into take into account. But, um, yeah, I, you know, as, and as, I think there's reputation goes a long way in science. So that, you know, I do try to le try to find, fun and forward thinking and interesting uh stuff with interesting angles but um yeah i don't know i try to stay away from the junk <laughs> just avoid or, the or, junk or, or and occasionally occasionally i can't resist mm -hmm. and picking then, at it it's like then, picking picking at a pimple or a scab yeah it, well <laughs> I don't, know, I don't know about that, but, it, but you know, there is, is sort of like the, the, the algorithms behind Twitter and Facebook where, which is that if you outrage people, they interact more totally would work on me. Uh, but I do it with, with, uh, science studies. So I'll read it. I'll look at a study and, and I'll go, Oh, this is terrible. The way that they've constructed this or, yeah, like, I don't know. There's the, the the recent one that just sticks out in my mind was the actually there's a couple, um, but there was the, the the there was a oh what is he? He's an economist. Uh, he's a pension. This guy does pension work. He studies ec economics. He's a, mm -hmm. an economics professor, but specifically has a history in working with government on pensions and things like this and mm -hmm. used Gompert's law, which is this 1800s equation that yeah. says that, you know, uh, once you get to a certain age up to about 80, uh, you know, the, the, the death rate is about 8% per year. And that this is how, you know, you can calculate the longevity of humans this way. It's oh like, uh, yeah, 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 yeah! I remember that one. I talked about that one, but it was we. I like I liked being able to joke about to dig into it. Yeah, well, so mm -hmm. this is you know, and and so this prediction that he came out with is based on you know uh, eighty being the new fifty or whatever nonsense. People living longer mm -hmm. with medical science showed these prediction graphs that showed people, and again, it was also country specific. Yeah, which. I don't recall seeing that specific data, 
for why one country's diet, like, like what information is being used to make it so in Italy, people are going to live to 141 years by the year 2050, or, you know, or, but, but it's only 136 in UK or whatever. Like, like there were some levels of nonsense involved. Also, it quoted the Bible in the introduction, which I thought was interesting or cited. Never seen the citation. A great of the Bible citation, before. unless you're doing I, religious it, studies or archaeology or yeah. yeah. <laughs> but a prediction a model yeah. of human biology and longevity. Good night, hard Showing hard. it going out to 141 years that we're going to be living longer and longer, while yeah. leaving out all references and information of biology of. Mm -hmm. Cellular senescence of telomeres of, of all the cancers, just, like all of the things I that we economics. know exist. Let's do Let me ignore all of science one and take rule. a mathematical model. And the thing that also bothered me about it is it's coming, it's being published right as the, the a political effort in the United States is looking to replicate what's happened in France. They got out to 64 years. We, I wish we could have 64 let's years as retirement. Increase, We're already past let's, that, right? Let's change the retirement age. They know? want to retain. Now they have a study mm -hmm. that you point to. It was like, hey, a science study said that people are going to live longer. So we should make the retirement age later. Well, it also has to do with wealth. It has to do with access to health care, which the United States is horrifically underserving its population when it comes to medical access. Oh, yeah. And it's not going to get know, so any all better. These features. And, and on top of it, yeah. the average life expectancy in the United States has actually gone down a little bit. Dropping. Yeah. And it's in, it's, Woo -woo. You know, right now, Woo -woo. it's like, it only gives you a couple of years after the current uh, Oh, I know age. what we need to do. We need to increase the retirement age as our mortality, our, our you know, right. our, then people our, will just work to death. We do work to death. We've that's done just, it. That's, Success. Let's just do that forever and ever and ever. Yeah. So if anything, we should be reducing it. If we're, if if we're, if United States mm. is a wealthy country, why would it be re increasing the retirement age? Shouldn't it be reducing it? How come should nobody's be. reducing the retirement age anywhere should be. on should the planet be. with all the progress, with all the technology, with all the wealth? And oh, why isn't it going the other? Yeah. Anyway. But that was an example of a study that actually pissed me off when I read it. I actually got mad at it. I was like, because eh, that's junk. It's it's junk. It's junk, junk, and it and it's junk that mm -hmm. I think was designed to serve a political purpose. Yeah, there's nothing yep. linking the authors to, but that to anything else. Yeah, but it but it you know especially why an else econ write economist it? and a and someone who works on pension stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, that just with that. Pol a, a policy expert on pension. Who, who's going to make this statement at the time in a state where the, where, by the way, where one of the senators uh, is pushing for this, you know, like I just, I guarantee that study is going to make its way into the congressional record. I mm -hmm. guarantee it. I guarantee it. It's going to be used. But if it's a wealthy country, if, if capitalism is a success, if capitalism is, success, is a successful model, we should be lowering the retirement age, not increasing it. Otherwise, it's a bad system. We need to try it in. Try something I, else. Try something that's got a lower retirement I'm not retirement voting age. against you on this. I, I, I'm, I I I'm here with you on it. And not the sort of thing you think about until you get to be my age. And then you're like, hey, wait a second. And since we are our ages, what I'm thinking about now is maybe... We should go take some time off. Oh, you know what? I, I feel like retiring right now. Let's retire a little bit. Sounds like a good like idea. Like for a week. Gesundheit. <laughs> yeah. Another one? There's another one in there. Hold it. He's, he's muted, but there's another one. It's waiting. It's tickling the nose. It's, ah, uh, no, no. There it is. Okay. One more. It's in threes. Isn't it always in threes for you? No, twos. Okay. I do two slightly bigger <laughs> sneezes, and I find a, a, the third one is then unnecessary. Totally unnecessary. Say good night, Kiki. Oh, good night, Kiki. Say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. Good. Oh, wait, but then we don't have the last thing to say. Good night. Good night, Kiki.
no, that's I already did that one. And, good night, and, minions. Good night, <laughs> patrons. Good night, Twist listeners. So long, good night, girl, YouTube leaders in science podcasts tonight. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the science and our after show and our pre-show and all the fun in-betweens. And we look forward to seeing you next week. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay curious. Stay educated, stay interested, stay interesting, don't be boring. <laughs> <laughs> And if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. Okay, I think I found my favorite one. <laughs> Good night, everybody. And remember, don't be boring. Don't be boring. I love it. That's my favorite.